Perhaps the first one I thought was important. <laughs> if you've never seen this, this was a form to be filled out. All you had to do was put an X in the box. Are you childish? Are you nervous? That one was pretty pronounced. Are you paranoid? No, why? I love that. Are you the racist one speaks for itself? The drunk one was, yeah, that's good. Uh, ask anybody in law enforcement. Are you an idiot? So, anyway, I saw that not long ago. It came to me from actually my first sergeant. So, this one was better. All of you older people should get that. You know the popcorn guy? That's pretty good. Yeah, good thing. Anyway. Okay, Orville Redenbacher owned a popcorn company and he introduced the world to microwave popcorn. Where you put the little flat bag in, turn your microwave on three and a half minutes later, boom. Get it? Okay, yeah, you guys are far too young, man. It's one of my favorites. Anyway. Well, let's get to our task at hand. Proverbs, if you would. Proverbs. Proverbs. We're going to look at verse 20, uh, first one of chapter 27. Namely, the title of this message tonight is, How Long Have You Got? Proverbs 27, verse 1. <coughs> Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. I'm going to ask you to read it with me. Let's all read it together. Ready? Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. I want to read one more verse, and it, it should be either there on the page or real close. It is Proverbs 29. We've read Proverbs 27, verse 1. Would you look with me at Proverbs 29, verse 1? He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, here for the next few moments, we are going to be looking at the word of God, we are mostly going to be looking at two lives. I pray that you will help us, quiet us, focus us. What is about to be said here is the most important words that will ever happen in these men and women's lives on this day, this time. I pray that you will help us, teach us, Carefully, in Jesus' name, amen. Rexon and that were normal, wound up, junior age kids who happened to come to a church one Sunday on a bus. They listened fairly well in the service. Rex was kind of a clown, and, and Annette was really shy, but they did okay. They were invited to come back the next Sunday. Rex was a sixth grader. 
uh, a, f a funny kid, practical joker, uh, loved games, especially playing tricks or pranks on the bus workers and the junior church preacher and his wife. Annette, on the other hand, was very shy. She was a second grader. Until she allowed people to come into her lives, she was very, very quiet and, and, and not really what we would call affectionate toward other people. Well, the next Sunday came around and, and Rex and Annette went back to church on the bus and they listened quietly once again to the junior church service. It was on the third Sunday they came that something happened to Rex and Annette. The junior church preacher preached to all the kids that day. There were about 75 children in their junior church and so he preached to them on knowing Jesus as their Savior. And he talked to them about how to accept God's gift of salvation by asking Christ to save them. He, he preached on the amazing greatness of heaven. And he also talked about that was the place where God would abide forever. And everyone who would know Christ as their Savior would go there and live with him. He also preached on the horrible, terrible, awful, inescapable eternity of hellfire forever. Reminding those children and young people of, of the never-ending burning to death while drowning in a lake of fire. The two most gruesome and horrible ways for a person to die. And yet because of the eternality of it, a person cannot die. They exist forever on the brink of death with no relief. The junior church preacher also used John chapter 3 and verse 16. And he told the young people that God loved them so much that he sent Jesus to come to the earth to be the Savior who would die on the cross and rise again. Proving not only that he was God, but that he was able to save their souls from the fires of hell forever. He showed the young people the Bible verse that says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He showed them Romans 10 verse 13, where the Bible says, For Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He showed them that God would save a person's soul if they would ask Jesus to save them and be their Savior, confess their sins, and asking Christ to, to, to save them and, and trusting Him 100% as their promise for heaven. For someday they would die. At the invitation, Rex who was sitting amongst the other boys, raised his hand when the junior church pastor asked if there was a young man or young lady who had never accepted Christ but would like to. And Annette, she was sitting by the junior church preacher's wife because she was still a little shy and she was kind of really the only adult she would sit with, but, but the junior church preacher's wife felt that brush against her arm when Annette's hand went up. Rex did not know that his sister had raised her hand. And Annette did not know that Rex raised his hand. They stayed after junior church dismissal and the junior church preacher and his wife led them both to Jesus Christ. Amen. It was an amazing day. And that day, Rex prayed and asked Jesus to forgive him of his sins. He asked Christ to save him, and Annette prayed and confessed to Jesus her sin. And, and she asked him to please be her Savior and save her soul. And that day, those kids were so excited, man. They bounded back out to the bus. They, they got ready to go home, and they were so excited. They were relieved. I always love watching people after they accept Christ and that sense of relief and peace that finally comes over them.
They knew how awesome it feels to be a Christian. Well, the junior church preacher and his wife were very excited too. So that Wednesday night in the prayer meeting at their church, there was a little bit of time for testimonies during the prayer request. They had time for praises. So both of them talked about these two new young people who had come into the junior church and they had gotten saved. And it, when their parents had given them permission, the junior church preacher and his wife in a week or two would go and check it. And then they would be able to get baptized and, and just come right into the church and grow up there. What was amazing that night is one of the school teachers of the public school, who actually happened to be Rex's sixth grade teacher, attended the same church. So he also stood up and confirmed it and said that Rex that day during show and tell had stood up and showed everybody the Bible that the junior church preacher gave him and then told everybody in class that God loved them. 72 hours later on that Saturday night, the junior church preacher was brushing up on his next morning's message, and he went to bed. About 3.30 in the morning, the phone rang. The man answered it, and on the other end, a crying voice said, Are you the preacher at Oakfield Baptist Church? And his answer was kind of abrupt. He said, no, but, but I preach the junior church at the church. I can get a hold of the pastor for you, but can I help you? And the voice on the other end, crying and screaming, do you know a boy and a girl named Rex and an Ed Vanderbilt? Do you know them? Ma'am, I, I happen to do know them. They're brand new kids. There's been an accident and you must come quickly. Click. Junior church preacher didn't know what to do. You know, he's 3 30 in the morning. But he was a licensed firefighter. He was not on duty that night, so he did not have his radios on. He got out of bed quickly, dressed, and although he was off duty, he did turn on his handheld radio to a flurry of fire traffic. He could see the glow in the sky up ahead, and he knew this house was fully involved. The only reason he knew their address is because the little decision card they had filled out the past Sunday, they had attended to, but they finally filled out the card. By 7 a.m. that Sunday morning, a skeleton of timbers was standing where a home had once been. Rex and Annette's dad and mom had been taken by helicopter to Spectrum Butterworth Campus, Grand Rapids, Michigan. They were both in critical condition. Fire investigators from the Michigan State Police and the fire chief himself found Rex's body right there at the base of his window. He tried to open his window and it wouldn't open. His body was charred, literally melted, in amongst everything that was at the bottom of that window case. Amy's body was literally melted into her mattress. She had died in her sleep and had burned so badly that she was not recognizable as a human being. The junior church preacher went home and he cried, and he cried, and he cried. He 
told his children of what had happened. And I will never forget my father telling me. Because I too was in that junior church and I saw both of them. My dad described the horribleness of that night to us. And yet, you know what? The only fire that Rex and Annette had to endure was for a few brief fleeting moments as their little bodies stopped functioning and their physical bodies died in that fire. Today, when I think about Rex and Annette, I realize that Rex is my age. He would be 52. Why did I make 52? And he didn't. Well, that's a question none of us will ever be able to answer. <laughs> I do know this. I know that today, Rex and Annette run and jump on golden streets. They talk about and enjoy the company of Jesus himself. Beings like Gabriel and Michael. Bible characters like Jonah and Paul and David and Isaac and Ruth. And Daniel and Esther and, and Peter. All those other Bible characters. They see people from history. They understand the saints of all the ages whose souls are as alive today as they ever were in the presence of God. They get to see and be with Jesus forever. They will never again feel pain. They will never again feel terror. They will never again feel hurt. Their little burned bodies were put in small caskets. They lie under the soil to this day at the Oldfield Cemetery. But their souls are alive with Jesus in heaven. And when he comes in the air of what we call the rapture, they will rise first where their bodies will once again be rejoined with their souls and their spirits. But this time they will be perfect. They will have no blemish, they will show no scar, they will show and bear no imperfection. Truly incredible. But some of you are here tonight, and if your heart quit beating, or you would have died in that house fire, the fire of hell would have just begun for you. Because the Bible says of hell that it is a place where the fire is never quenched. Where the worms and the stench and the rot of it are never quenched. The Bible declares it to be a place of weeping. And not just weeping, but the wailing that most of you have never heard. But I have heard many times when I've stood in a trauma room and watched parents sobbing uncontrollably over a young person of theirs who has been killed. Watching a young man who graduated from my Christian school as he tried for 30 minutes to save his 54-year-old mother. He was doing the chest compressions and trying to do the CPR as she laid there and could not respond. And when I showed up in that trauma room and I saw him over his mother's body holding her. Most of you have no idea what wailing is. Right. The Bible declares that hell is a place of gnashing of teeth. The hurt. All of the bitterness. All of the hatred. All of the animosity. All of that coming together in a place so horrible that only scripture could give it proper vocabulary terms. No escape. 
No way out. No relief. No water. No break. None. None. And it's forever and ever. And yet you sit here tonight and you are not sure that if you died tonight you would go to heaven. Because you and I both know that if you died tonight you would go straight to hell. You do not know Christ. You might know about him, but you do not know him. And your life has none of the signs of it. There's no heartbeat. There is no blood pressure. If we touched your spiritual eye, you would not respond. <coughs> you would go to hell because you never accepted Christ as your Savior. You live in unbelief. You've never become a Christian by trusting in what Jesus did at Calvary when he died on the cross to save you. If you don't think it's real, you better think again. This is little KJ's casket. It was custom made. KJ died. Car accident. No fault of his own. Four. You know how many men I've buried under the age of 40? How numb a widow and those two children were to stand there and let someone take their photo. All because he died in a construction accident. I remember the day. The town was abuzz. Everyone was getting ready. It was the biggest night of the year. Ross Common High School. It was the big football game. It was homecoming. And here they came, several convertibles, and the kids were sitting in the convertibles waving at everyone when a fire call came out. And a fireman, not knowing that they were coming around the corner, hit one of the cars, and he killed the homecoming queen on her way to the football stadium. Let me tell you something. You need to quit this. Quit messing around because you can't even make your heart beat. You cannot manufacture your own breath. And you can say I'm too harsh and my photos are too graphic. But this is the business I have served in for many years. And I'm tired of watching people die and go to hell because we are too afraid to face the reality of life and death. She was beautiful. When he hit her car, she, she literally threw her out of the car and she hit her head on the black top. That's it. I'd like to ask you a question tonight. How long have you got? How long have you got? My father-in-law had nine days. Nine days from the date he was diagnosed with acute lymphoma. Nine days. Gone. One of the saddest pictures I have in my files is my wife and my mother standing there when we first walked in as they're looking into that casket. Numb. Numb. It's gone. In 
Michigan a few weeks ago, an eighth grader was playing basketball and he died instantly when he was running and suddenly collapsed. In Michigan last winter, a 13-year-old girl on a junior high volleyball team tripped and fell on the court and died from the trauma laying on that gym floor in front of 250 fans. And don't you tell me, I'm going to live the old, I can do anything I want, I'm going to live forever. Yeah, you better think of because only with Jesus will you live forever. <laughs> Seven astronauts never expected the space shuttle Columbia to explode in a fireball, killing them instantly over the skies of Texas on re-entry. All because one heat shield, one little square had let go somewhere in space and they could not account for it. One little piece. And when they found their flight suits, because they were no mechs and because they were fireproof, their bodies were completely burned in them. I don't believe when I was sitting in college at a, at a, at a, 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 a gathering, we were all sitting there and the vice president came in and said, ladies and gentlemen, I need to tell you something. Just a few seconds ago, the, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded over the, 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 the state of Florida and we don't know what's happening. All because of a defective O-ring. It's a little piece of rubber. And those men and women died instantly. Three people die every second. And my funeral director was right. Because as he with tears was embalming that town queen, he reminded me, Dave, Dave, remember the two rules in mortuary science. Rule number one, people die. And rule number two, they're not always old. That's why Hebrews 9, 27 and 28 faces a reality that a lot of people don't want to look at. As is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So I'm going to ask you a simple question. How long have you got? How long have you got? First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Pardon my French, but ain't no one else ever done that. And what I believe to be the greatest statement God ever made to humans. Jesus made it to a man who was sitting with him. In the night, and Jesus said to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I love life. The word believeth there means to trust completely, to place one's trust in. And I believe Nicodemus did that. I'd like to ask you a question. Because tonight you make a choice. You can choose 
whether you will agree and believe with what the Bible says or keep doing your own thing. Because you're going to make the choice. <coughs> I love the passage here. But there's a real simple reminder. I'm glad that 11 year old kid made that decision at that junior church. I saw him three times. The fourth time I saw him, I couldn't see inside a closed casket. All I saw was a picture. And those two little caskets were side by side at the front of the church. My father and mother were so devastated that I had not seen my parents that hurt, except one other time when they were forced out of the church ministry. You see, ladies and gentlemen, that's why this passage exists. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation have I succored thee. I have pulled you close to myself. I have brought you to me. And God's clear words. Black and white. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold. Now is the day of salvation. It's time for you to grow up and think this through. And for that purpose tonight, I have not treated you like boys and girls. I have treated you like men and women. In fact, I have probably treated you more like soldiers than I have children. It's time for you to think this through. Is today your day? We don't know. Is this weekend that weekend? Every time I go on a Coast Guard flight, the pilot and the crew, we stand there and we call our loved ones. Hey, just wanted you to know we're going to be launching here in a minute. I'll let you know when we touch down. I was taught that from the first flight I ever made. Love you. Because I just don't. Four out of ten people on Kansas roads are driving under the influence of either drugs, cannabis, or alcohol 24-7. Alcohol kills. Drugs kill. Cannabis kills. And you're getting in cars every day and driving the opposite way of time. I think it's time for you to really think this through. And I think it's time for you to stop the excuse making. I think it's time for you to stop all of the bluster. And it's time for you to stop crossing your arms, stiffening your neck, and throwing up that cocky, arrogant attitude. And it's about time for you to grow up and think like a woman or think like a man. And for that reason tonight, I have not treated you like children. I have exposed you to intimate, personal, graphic things to give you an understanding of some of the things I've seen and done and lived and experienced in my lifetime. And let me tell you something. Without Jesus, you're lost.
Without Jesus, you're already dead. Your heart is beating and your brain has activity, but you're dead in trespasses and sin. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Is today your day? I don't know. But I do know that you do not know how long you've got. So the question is rhetorical. You cannot answer it. Every morning when I run, my wife reminds me, make sure you take your phone. And I laugh and say, yeah, because if I got hit, I could at least lay in the road and make that last phone call. <laughs> I'm not really afraid of death like that. But I've seen so much of it. But when my father-in-law gathered us around his bed, my children were sobbing. And I said, Dad, we have to leave. We have to leave. David is due at Pensacola tomorrow evening. Lauren has a three-day drive out to West Coast. We have to go. And that healthy body said, pray together. And David and I were standing in the Alabama State House talking to the troopers when the phone call came. Ann was in Phoenix, Arizona. They drove through the night. Bob and I didn't. They drove through the night and Ann was about an hour outside of Phoenix on this side of it when, when the phone call came. When she called me on the phone, all she said was, Dave, Dad's gone. And I said, you got to pull over. You can't, I can't keep going. Thank God we had a Christian businessman friend in Phoenix. He had pastored for 23 years and then had an affair with a lady in the church who was no longer in ministry. But he was a good friend and he kept being a soul winner. And I stayed his friend because far too often we destroy and annihilate our wounded. I called him on the phone and I said, Frank, I desperately need your help. He said, Dave, I'll drop whatever I'm doing. And with 23 years of ministry experience, he ministered to my wife and my daughter. My kids couldn't even attend their grandma's funeral. But I remember attending Rex and Annette's. Those little caskets. I just don't know. I just don't know. But I do know this. That while I cannot answer that question, and while you cannot answer that question, absolutely rock solid 100% confidence that if your time comes you will go to heaven and live forever but it's only through Christ your church never died on the cross and rose from the dead the Virgin Mary never died on the cross and rose from the dead Prophet Muhammad never died on a cross and rose from the dead. The communion table never did it. Confession of sins to a priest never did it. The priest himself never did it. I chose as a young man to trust the one who died and rose again. And I've staked my eternal life on it. How long have you got? You've got right now. Father in heaven, 
tonight could be the night when that young man who is sitting here accepts Christ as his Savior. What an amazing weight will fall.